Hello and welcome to week three of Introduction to Healthcare and Business Analytics. And these are the topics I wish I want to talk about today. Uh, we're going to be talking about managing data definitions and how critical that is for analytics. And as a part of that, we'll get into the, the differences and similarities between metrics, KPIs, and benchmarks and what, the, and what those each mean and why those are so important. We'll talk about visualization tools that you can then use to display your information to an end user and help them make sense of things. We'll talk about the different kinds of data analysis pitfalls that you, could, that you can run into, as well as effective reporting, including a discussion of what is essentially push versus pull in terms of getting information out into people who may need it at the time. So let's talk about data definitions first. This is a, a very, very key component within uh, managing an effective analytics operation and something that I talk to people about constantly because it's a, it, it is a, it's, it's a constant area where people tend to neglect in terms of um, uh, rolling out an effective analytics program. So first of all, what is a data definition? It is basically acquiring, validating, storing, protecting, and processing required data. And and it ensures accessibility, reliability, and timeliness of the data for its users. So essentially, how do you know what you are defining? How do you know what means what? And um, how can you uh, be sure that the data is giving you the information that you think it's giving you? So it's this is where, and I often told this is singing from, everyone needs to be singing from the same sheet of music. This is critical to, under, to gaining acceptance of data as a strategic asset because data elements can be complex. They can be related to each other, but not. They can be, you can, you can think you have something and it's different. You can, you can have something which may change over time and you don't necessarily understand that. You have systems which may come from multiple places and uh, they may not be, they may not agree with each other. And what will end up happening is, and you may have experienced this yourselves, what I've seen a lot is if, 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 if the definitions are not managed properly, then what will happen is users will spend hours in, in, in meetings arguing over what the data is saying, as opposed to using it to actually solve problems. This is, by the way, is especially uh, common in a situation where the data is telling people something they don't, they don't necessarily want to hear. Uh, so if you're getting some piece of news that you may want to not deal with so you you may say well what about this and what about this and what about this and if the definitions aren't managed properly then there are lots of places to go that to potentially hide an issue that the that an organization should really be addressing so here's i want to give you an example this is a healthcare example but those of you who are on the business side should probably could probably also appreciate this this is why a, a data definition is critical let's say a person walks into a hospital emergency department at 11 45 p.m so they sit in the waiting room, they're not seen until 1.30 a.m., so it's actually the following day. They are examined and they're admitted at, and they're admitted at 9 a.m. that day. Um, they're, um, and they're, uh, they're put into um, uh, an observation unit, and while in that observation unit, they, they, they suffer a myocardial infarction or a uh, heart attack, and, 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 and they're transferred to the ICU. So they spend two days in observation, they spend four days in the ICU, they go, they go back to a standard inpatient bed for three days, and then, and then they're discharged to a skilled nursing facility for 10 days. What's the length of stay? And depending on how you count and what you're doing, it could be seven days, eight days, nine days, 10 days, 18 days, 19 days, or 20 days. Uh, so uh, is it when the person visibly walked into the, into the, into the ER, which was before, before midnight the previous day? Is it the following day? Does the time in the observation unit count? In some places it does, some places it doesn't. Does the skilled nursing facility just uh, time count? Some places it does, some places it doesn't. And this is a, this is a, a, a situation where I could give you se several different ways of calculating this one number, and in many ways they're all correct, which is what often causes problems with with organizations who are being able to manage this. So. In terms of managing definitions, this is a key, a key component. All data elements that are being used have to have a declared definition. And uh, metrics, uh, metrics themselves, which are a combination of elements, which we'll get into in a moment, have some sort of embedded selection criteria. Now, this could be time-based or codes-based. Um, if, if the codes which, in which a metric is dependent upon are added or changed, the metric will, mean, will need to be updated. Uh, let me give you an example for this. Let's, uh, let's use a healthcare example uh, again. Say, for example, you are uh, tracking patients who have received breast cancer screenings. And uh, so you are looking for 
uh, female, you are looking for a certain age range, and you are certain, and you are looking for various procedures based upon a code set of procedures that are being given. Now, these codes are updated year to year. A lot of times, they get more and more specific. So, if you as you go from year to year, you may have to add additional codes to that to that definition to be able to properly capture uh, breast cancer screening. If you are a uh, if you're a company and you're and say for example you're uh, Pillsbury and you're selling flour, um, you may be uh, you know is is flour a bag? Is it a pallet? Is it a truck? Uh, you if you have two pound bags or five pound bags or ten pound bags, are they all being counted the same way? Um, is a do you have a situation where perhaps something is being sourced differently than something else? So even with something as simple as seemingly simple as flour, you could end up with things being being counted differently. So um, and and so in, in a situation going back to the breast cancer screening, say I have you know you know five codes that are that are uh, a part of that, and say so say the next year they add a code, so now it's, so now it's six. So you have to add that six code to be able to have it be comparable from year to year. But there may be situations where a metric has changed so much that it's actually a different number. So uh, in that situation, say for example, you are um, screening everybody who is over the age of 40, and uh, so then that 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 uh, amounts to your to your population being given a breast cancer screening. Well, what has happened in the last few years is that the science has changed. So now they say that breast cancer screenings need to be over the age of 50. So in in that situation. The metric actually changes because the population that is eligible for that has actually changed. So if I couldn't, so you you can't take a, a number that is based upon a, a prior year and compare it to a number based upon a current year because the underlying numbers of people under that are changed. So therefore, therefore, what you have to do in that situation, you make an entirely different metric, which uh, accounts for that. So this is all part of the of, of the uh, of the fundamental notion of data quality and what your data is actually saying and what your data can actually do. And this is a, uh, a graphic I used in the previous in the previous session, and I, and I want to emphasize it again. If you have poor data quality or if you have unknown data quality, it's equivalent to driving your car with a fogged up windshield. You might be able to get where you're going, but in all after a period of time, you are going to start running into things. You're not going to get information you 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 want to get. You're going to miss things that you should that you should see, whether it is. The, whether it is um, an issue around breast cancer screening within within a hospital, or an issue around uh, uh, counting how many bags of flour you have uh, for um, Pillsbury, or um, or whether it's running your car into a telephone pole, it, uh, you know the principles are, are are very much the same. So uh, I talked a little bit about about metrics. I want to get a little bit a little bit deeper into what all those mean. Is there something that get, that that you hear a lot? Uh, as, as, as well as KPIs and benchmarks. What does all that What does all that mean? Um, a metric is a standard of measurement by which efficiency, performance, progress, or quality of plan, process, or product can be assessed. So it is usually a combination of data elements that is done for for one of those types of purposes. So and a, a metric has got some type of a criteria associated with it. And say in many cases it is a number, it could be a rate, it could be a ratio, it could be a percentage, it could be a ranking. Um, and so these are combinations of different things that are all being that are all being done. Some metrics have are fairly simple calculations, such as simple percentages. They may be they may be fairly simple. Some are the the functions of some pretty sophisticated linear and or um, and your multiple and or logistic logistic regression techniques uh, to be able to come up with. And how you define that is um, there are whole courses in terms of how that's all being done. But I want to give you uh, some some general types of metrics uh, that uh, that you often run into. First of all, there are um, efficiency metrics. So in a hospital, one, one a common metric you'll often hear is called door to dock. How long does it take that person to walk into the door and be seen by somebody, and that's and that's a time period that's being that's being measured. If that time gets too long, patients get frustrated and they start going elsewhere. Uh, on a similar basis, for any kind of a company that is managing a call center, what is your call? What is your average call wait time? What is uh, how long does somebody wait on the phone to talk to a representative that you, for whatever reason, say it's Cox Cable or something of like that? They're they're, they're going to be they're going to be monitoring information like that. A turnaround time. If I send something out to somebody, how long does it take to get back? 
if I am if I am asking for uh, a product delivery, how long does it take from the time I get the order to the time it, to the time it's been processed to the time it's been shipped? That's an that's an important metric I have in terms of productivity. There are financial metrics, um, cost ratios, contribution margins are common are common uh, financial metrics. There are uh, all you have to do is go to the uh, Financial Accounting Standards Board and you'll see a list of those things as long as your arm that will help that will that will give you that kind of information. A utilization metric is a, uh, a very common item. How many in, in a hospital? How many OR beds do I have? Do I have available? How many patients do I have in the hospital at at, at any given time? Uh, if you're dealing with things like office space, what's your vacancy rate? If you're renting apartments, what is your what is your vacancy rate? Um, and and you and, and those are those are very important metrics to be able to track. Now, metrics in terms of helping you answer a question, there think of it in terms of a dependent and an independent variable in elementary statistics. So you are uh, a you have a a dependent variable where you are tracking you are tracking something based upon something else. So you may be tracking a change in a metric based upon the change in other data elements that are um, that are out there. So for example, um, are hospital readmissions driven up by a change in medical condition? Are, um, uh, are response times for um, uh, product product delivery dependent upon changes in weather or upon changes in staffing. Any of those any of those items are dependent and and independent variables. And there may be some situations where you're controlling on, where a, a metric could be a dependent variable, and some situations where it could be an independent variable. And that really depends on the analysis that you're that you're doing. There are some metrics or there are some data elements which are pretty pretty much appropriately uh, independent variables because you're not really doing anything to anything to change them. A lot of these have to do a lot of a lot of those type of metrics are demographic metrics or 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 uh, demographic variables. So you're if if you're looking at um, prevalence of a certain disease in an area um, and you're and you're looking and, and you're doing a a a a background a a a, a cutout by the race of the patient. You're not trying to change the race. You're trying to change the disease. So the race is is a is a uh, independent variable that is being used to that you're being used to understand how it may impact the prevalence of a certain disease state. Now, a KPI, a KPI is a form of a metric, uh, and this is a quantifiable measure that is used to 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 evaluate the success of an organization in meeting a specific performance objective. Now, these are uh, usually well defined, and they are usually monitored very very closely. So, it is it is a type of metric. Um, but they are uh, areas that organizations spend a, a lot of time paying attention to. So it is, and so so, uh, so for for um, for example, on that, a um, you, you could have a uh, KPI, you could have a KPI that which which deals with these type of response times and turnaround times, and you have to and you have to report based upon that. If you are a, a, a computer hosting company, you may have a KPI that says your website has to be up a certain period of time. You can't have more than an X number of hours or minutes of downtime over a certain period of time. If you exceed that, then there is either some type of, of, a, of a report that may there may even be a financial penalty if it's a contractual relationship. Now let's talk a little, a little bit about uh, benchmarks here. So a um, a benchmark is essentially taking a metric and it is it is applying it to some type of a standard. So I see a number is that you know, so somebody says that my my turnaround time uh, for um, a door to door to dock. Let's go to let's use that same example again. From the time a patient walks into when they're seen, let's say that turnaround time is 75 minutes. Well, is that good? Is it bad? Is it is it is it better than I want? Is it is it is it worse than I want? Uh, how do you know that if you don't benchmark? If you don't have some type, it's some type of standard that you are at least shooting for. Now, how, how benchmarks can be done can be um, tricky in of itself. Um, you, in, in, in some situations, a benchmark could be an industry standard. In some situations, a benchmark could be something as simple as what has your been, what has been your average performance over the last number of months. Uh, and and then what you may do is you may, if you're trying to improve uh, efficiency, you take your last 
uh, you'll last several months of performance, and then you you and then you take that and you reduce it by by say five percent because you're because you're shooting for a better performance. Those are things that are all reasonable things to do depending on the different types of situations. And this is this to me, this picture is a great example of what happens when you don't benchmark. I took this picture uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was in the midst of a it was a labor dispute at uh, Bay State Medical Center outside of Springfield, Massachusetts. I was out in Northampton at the time, and that is a billboard that was on Interstate 91 outside of, outside of Northampton, and it's showing these different patient scores for quality outcomes and patient perspective. Um, and I'm looking at them. I have absolutely no idea what they're trying to do. Uh, I don't. They're, they're saying they have their their point. They have an arrow pointing at a quality score of 12.5. Is that good? Is it bad? Is it what is it based upon? Is it a is it a is it a scale of one to 100? Is it a scale of one to 50? Is it a scale of one to 1,000? I have absolutely no idea looking at that. And so I, I I laughed when I saw this because you know I have money was spent on this billboard, but they're not. There's no there's no information being presented to anybody, even somebody, even people who I've shown this billboard to many people in healthcare, and they all kind of scratch their heads as they have absolutely no idea what these folks are trying to do. So this is kind of an idea of what happens when you don't benchmark something. So now that we've talked about metrics, KPIs and benchmarks, I want to talk about some data visualization tools that are out there and they're and that are on, on, available. Uh, data visualization is is really a modern discipline of visual communication. It is, it is creation and study of visual representation of data that has been abstracted in some way that can give you some insights in terms of in terms of variables and units of information. And it helps it, it, it helps you get at the reason for why things are happening. And this looking at the type of analytics that we talked about the last time, this gets into the diagnostic analytics. Why is something happening, not just what is happening? And it can give you some, and it can give you some insights. It can tell you where you where you may be able to go to get information as to where you, as to where you wish to you wish to do. And the idea is to make the complex more accessible and understandable. Is to give somebody information and to give them insights, those kind of aha moments that they might not have had otherwise. And this is a and, and there is and there's a, both an art and a science to this in terms of how it's all being done. Now there are some several very common data visualization tools. Here are a few examples. You've probably heard of some or all of these in various ways. One of the most common ones out there, I use it in my own in my own company, is Tableau. Uh, uh, it is a wonderful visualization tool that has some great mapping capabilities. It has some great. I, I love maps. I love heat maps myself, and I love. It, it's a great dashboarding tool, uh, and that's a that's a, that's a very common and a very and a very powerful one out there in the market. Another is Power BI, which does similar which does similar things. You also have tools. These are a little bit older, but you have business objects and crystal reports. They're older, but they also will, will, will perform those kinds of functions. Or even something as simple as Microsoft Excel can be used as a data visualization tool, depending on the uh, situation and the, and, and, and the uh, environment. Now, all of these tools are acceptable. People ask me, should I... Should I should I roll out Tableau or Power BI or Click or and I'm, my my response is always yes you should but then but then the issue is how do you implement it how are are you are you presenting people with the right kind of information um, there's an old saying I use for people a lot it's a stroke of the brush doesn't guarantee art from the bristles and the key is how the tool is used not not in, not in the tool itself. It's the same thing as working with um, a, um, a a PowerPoint slide deck. Um, I don't profess to be an expert in PowerPoint decks, but I have an idea myself what I think what I think works and what I think doesn't. And I've seen some I've seen some PowerPoint decks that are absolutely spectacular, and I've seen some that are absolutely wretched. Um, I'm hoping this one is at least somewhere in between. But uh, you kind of get an idea that it's it's the it's how you use the tool. It's not it's not the tool itself. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about we we're, we put data in the hands of users. And I think all of us have an obligation to uh, to give people information and give people insights that that allows them to make a decision from an honest and objective perspective. And um, I see too often I see people try to use data to manipulate things in ways to get to get an answer to come out that they that they may want, which, but but which may be. Um, misleading at best or even deceptive at worst. And sometimes folks don't even realize that they're they're doing it. So I want to talk a little bit about a few things. There's, there's correlation versus causation, which is um, a very common 
uh, problem. We see a lot of it. I've heard a ton of it in the in the, in the uh, COVID debates over the last year and a half. Uh, there's there's cherry picking, false dichotomy, slippery slope, and false analogy. I want to talk a little bit about uh, about each one of them. Now there are other ones out there as well, but this kind of gives you an idea as to what the different type of things are. So first of all, in terms of uh, you, you want to remember there's a, there's a very key component called cognitive bias. There's observation bias and confirmation bias. In observation bias, it's essentially we look for, we see what we expect to see. So if the old saying, if you go looking for trouble, you're liable to find it. It can cause you to jump to conclusions because you already, you've already had the answer in your head before you start to get the, get the information as to whether, as to whether it's true or not. Um, and then confirmation bias is that we tend to follow information sources which tend to confirm your point of view. This is, this is uh, you only have to go to, to today's modern media sources to see that. It's not difficult to, to imagine that people who, are, uh, who tend to identify as being more uh, politically conservative spend, spend, tend, tend, to watch, tend to watch Fox News, whereas people who are, consider themselves to be more politically liberal tend to watch MSNBC because they, people tend to gravitate towards things, towards sources of information, which have tilts and slants, which confirm their, 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 uh, their, their pre-existing views and biases. And um, that's, a, that's a real danger, not only to good decision-making, but it's frankly a danger to our democratic way of life. So here is a, a common element. It's called co co correlation versus causation. Now, the, uh, there's, a, there's a Latin term, which you may have heard, it's called post hoc ergo propter hoc, which means after it, therefore, because of it, which is essentially, it, it's a logical fallacy. So you assume that because something happened before something else, it was caused by that something else. But it's actually very rarely true. So um, you, you may see something, but it didn't necessarily cause something like this picture here of um, you have a roof which is partially collapsed and a cat that is sitting on top of the roof. No, the cat did not collapse the roof. The cat is, the cat is just sitting there. Uh, but it, um, I put this up on social media a few weeks ago and I got a lot of, um, a lot, a lot of laughs saying that's, a, uh, saying that's, that's, that's one, that's one hell of a kitty cat, but you kind of get an idea that, you know, this is, this is a, the cat being on the roof is correlated. It is not causative. The cat did not cause the roof to collapse. Then we have cherry picking. This is often the result of the of, of observation bias that we have. So we basically um, that we basically form data to reach a predetermined conclusion. So here uh, here we have it said that of, that we that we surveyed a study and it said that 100% of those people who, uh, of those people felt better. Well, what about the other 96% who we didn't hear from or 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 or, or, or who may have left? Uh, so you you're you're ignoring a large portion of the of of the information to basically come out with a uh, result that you want to be able to do. We have false dichotomy, um, and this this kind of thing drives me crazy. I hear this. You you when you have a notion where you claim there's only two choices, but there's actually quite a few more. So there, here's an example of you can either stay at your current job or quit and live in poverty. Well. Maybe you get a different job. Maybe you have other options at your at your disposal. It's it's ignoring that and giving people an option that they, an idea that they have fewer choices than they have. That's a false dichotomy. Then we have slippery slope. This is another area that that and this is another area that that data can be used to back up if you're not very really 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 careful. It is basically implying that one thing leads to something which leads to something else which leads to something else. So. Um, the you know I'm seeing I'm seeing it in the in the um, COVID debates. Wearing a mask means that we're all going to become communists. No, we're wearing a mask <laughs> it's because of, because of COVID. Uh, you're getting you you get these kind of these type of arguments which can which can lead to wildly distorted ideas in terms of what an actual cause and effect might be. And then the next thing I want to talk about is false analogy, which are you're you're comparing two things that are really not similar enough to each other to, to uh, compare. And this is a, this is a, this is from a PETA ad. You know, PETA is always fun to pick on because they starve. It says you wouldn't eat your dog. Why would you eat a turkey? Well, you're really not going to eat a dog anyway, and, uh, at least not in this country. So it's kind of a, it's just kind of a, it's kind of a silly 
uh, an analogy, but you'd be amazed how many of these things you see with the using using actual actual data in an actual actual decision point of uh, um, of what someone's trying to do. So it's 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 always important to keep things in perspective, and you rarely have all the information. And the idea is to try and get as as, as complete a picture as possible from a dispassionate way and as um, and as solid an understanding as possible. This is an image my wife uses a lot in her with it with her clients and within her company. She uh, uh, she runs a uh, um, um, an Ayurveda practitioner service called the Holistic Highway, where someone, these are basically all blind people who are trying to understand an elephant. So the person at the at, at the one end you know, touches the elephant's tusk thinks it thinks it's a spear. The person with the trunk, the elephant's trunk thinks it's a snake. The person with the, with the ears thinks it's a fan. The person hanging on the tail thinks it's a rope. But you don't see the whole thing. Um, and that's it, it's just an important message to always be able to take it, try to take a step back and to see the larger picture of things. So now that I've gone, I've talked a little bit about how you can lead people in the wrong in the wrong direction. I want to talk a little bit about push versus pull reports, and um, and how that and how that can be um, important in terms of in terms of how to get information to people. So first of all, uh, there is a pull report. Now, a pull report is something that we use all the time. So it is something that you expect somebody who is sitting in an office to go out and get. It could be as something as simple as you log into your bank account, and um, you're going to you're going to connect to your bank account, and you're going to pull up your your checking account, and, and you're going to see your transactions, and you're going to see how much money you have in there. That's a pull report. So the bank isn't going to necessarily send that to you. Um, but they, it, it is there for you to use at whatever point you think it is appropriate to do. Now, this is, these are things that, um, there, these are important items, but not necessarily time critical. They're time critical to based, based upon the user. Then, but then you have a push report. This is something that you expect the user to be able to know and be able to identify immediately. So this is, this is something, um, usually something that is, um, um, potentially something bad that you want to avoid avoid happening. So let's use the bank account analogy. Say, for example, you have a um, an alert set up on your bank account where if your if your balance falls below a certain amount, you get and you get an alert, usually like a text message or something of that kind that says, "Hey, your your account balance is getting is getting low. Uh, you don't so that you, so that you don't have an overdraft charge or anything or anything like that." Um, in a healthcare environment, you may get a push report that might indicate um, you have a patient on your floor who's at risk for a fall. So you may want to have that have that piece of information so that you know that you know when you're when you're when you're going to want to get uh, additional help in. Or um, say, for example, you're a nurse manager on a floor. You've got ten rooms to manage. And on on any one given night, you may have a patient who's at risk for falling. Now, for those of you who don't work in healthcare. Um, a patient who falls in a hospital is a very, very big deal. Uh, a lot of times, these are folks who are who are elderly. They are unsure, unsure on their feet. You can end up with broken with broken hips, with broken ribs, with different things which may happen on your watch, and they're very bad events. You don't you want to avoid them at all costs. So if you have if you're a nurse manager in, in, in charge of a series of rooms, you want to know who is who is at risk for a fall. And usually, patients are uh, assessed for that based upon either a prior fall or a diagnosis of uh, stroke or, symp or syncope or dizziness or anything of that kind, something which may, or, or the kind of medication they're on, something which may indicate that they're susceptible to falling. Well, what if you're that manager and let's say on, on, on a given Friday night, for luck of the draw and, uh, and out of your 10 rooms, seven of them are a fall risk, just, just because that's what, that's what you happen to get. Well, you definitely want that, want that push report then because if you have seven patients out of out of ten who are a, who are a fall risk and they all need to use the bathroom at the same time, you're going to have a problem if you don't have it, if you don't get additional help. So that kind of a push report would tell a nurse manager that hey, I need to put my hand up, I need to get more help, I need to get more people in here because I'm going to have a, a more labor intensive evening than I than, than I have otherwise. That way you can avoid an adverse event happening that you wouldn't want to happen. So that's how you can use analytics to um, to uh, get at what can otherwise be a potentially very dangerous patient safety issue. Now here, now this is where you run into some problems of, of things that could be miscategorized. If a pull report should be a push 
should be a push or forth. That means you're, you're getting somebody information too, too late to make a difference. They're moving about their day. They don't necessarily know that something is happening and they don't and they don't think necessarily to access it. Or a push or forth could be a, could be a pull. Uh, sometimes you give uh, people who may design information to go out on a push and you end up with what's called alert fatigue. People getting so much information at so many different times, you start ignoring it. And then you end up losing the effectiveness of what the report is trying to do. So this is going to move on to our online discussion for this week. Uh, I want you, I want you to, from your own perspective, to discuss the difference between push and pull reports and how alert fatigue can interfere in, in current decision making. I've also got a, um, a TED talk up on uh, data management uh, that I'd like you to look at this week, and uh, that's a that's that's a YouTube video that's that's available within the, within within the Canvas module. So um, I will I want to I want to thank you very much for for um, for listening to this, and I will um, I will see you on the uh, discussions. And if you have any questions, please don't feel don't feel please feel free to reach out. Again, thanks very much.